lot of people say that to be a millionaire, you have to be self-employed, independent and all of that. I've seen bank employees uh, who became millionaire being employees. Hello guys, Alex Feratov here. And today we have an amazing guest, Baba. He's an investment manager from Switzerland. And today we will learn some of the, you know, high level investment, you know, strategies, pretty much how the whole like banking investment industry works. He is a uh, investment manager. Yep. If you can explain that. Yeah, of course, of course. It. So um, uh, basically I started uh, my career managing um, wealthy clients mainly based in Sub-Saharan Africa and uh, uh, UAE, Middle East, starting off maybe 1 million in assets. Mm -hmm. And then slowly, slowly, you know, getting to other um, client segments. Uh, my latest client segment was um, starting from 10 million. Basically, what I used to do at the bank in Geneva is to, you know, I have the client and um, I worked on, a, on an advisory basis. So uh, having the client's assets uh, on an account and um, coming up with ideas, calling the clients, discussing ideas, uh, where to invest the money. Uh, it could be like simple stuff like stocks, bonds, uh, mutual funds. It could be more complicated stuff like uh, structured products, dealing with options and all of that. And also having um, some sort of holistic view uh, on the client's assets. So um, dealing with their mortgages, financing yachts, jets and all of that. So uh, this is what I used to do um, at the bank and now joining an um, external asset manager in Dubai. It's going to be even broader. So we're more like a one-stop shop. So um, um, dealing with as many banks as we, as we want for even one client. If this bank cannot offer the service that the client wants, we can go in at another bank. And so yeah, it's uh, basically to be considered like, like a one-stop shop uh, dealing with all the aspects of, uh, of a client's assets. Wow. How much, uh, like, so if you can disclose that, like how much in um, assets, like have you like combined all of your yeah. clients? Look, um, uh, at the bank, I had a portfolio of about $350 million spread about, uh, among maybe 15 clients. Mm -hmm. uh, but this, the clients didn't have all the assets uh, with us. Uh, for example, I had a client, he had um, around 25, 30 million uh, with us. Uh, but his uh, net worth is over a billion. So we, we had those type of clients as well. Ultra, ultra high net worth, um, crossing a billion dollars uh, net worth. What is mainly the reason that people would use, let's say, um, use financial managers like in the first place, you know, considering all of the other alternative options that they have? Firstly, is for our knowledge uh, about the markets, um, the, um, the options that we have, uh, for instance, I talk with many people and they, they're not aware that, you know, the way we can leverage uh, investments. Uh, I'll give you one example. If you invest in um, invest, investment grade bonds, so uh, high quality bonds, um, the bank is ready to give you a, a, a lend you money on that. So if you want a hundred a hundred dollars uh, investment in a bond, the bank might lend you about 60 bucks. So 60 percent LTV. Uh, then you leverage your investment, uh, make make it like two, three times um, higher figure, you know. So a lot of these things people don't know about because they're not used to it. They don't make the uh, adequate research on internet and all of that. Uh, also, um, doing options uh, because you know to, to trade options is very particular because the it's like over the counter um, deals. So you don't have like stocks. You go on Google, you check for for example Apple's uh, stock price option it, it moves like on a daily basis you need to be very careful with what you do the contract sizes are much bigger than what you're investing if you buy one option basically you're taking the the, the promise of buying a hundred contracts a hundred uh, stocks uh, per contract so it's big leverage it's very risky so you need knowledgeable people to you know manage the risk mitigate the risk for you explain to you all of that um, so that's why we have we have those types of, of, of clients and you know a lot of clients they're busy with their own businesses they don't have time to go on, 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 on the computer and, and check the prices, the stocks, where their levels are at, et cetera. So this is where, where we, we play our role. Wow, yeah. fascinating, fascinating. So um, let's say, you know, the clients, right? Like average client that you would work with, say they have 20, 30 million dollars. Mm -hmm. Say that makes money, right? Is there like, have you seen most of the clients just keeping that capital there and you keep reinvesting you know, with, with that compound interest? Mm -hmm. Or do, have you seen them like extracting and spending it on lifestyle and stuff like that? Honestly, they keep the money there. They keep the money there because um, a lot of clients, you know, they, they, they run businesses. Uh, I, we also have clients, they are employees. And this is like a small, small uh, uh, 
thing I wanted to talk about. A lot of people say that uh, to be a millionaire, you have to be self-employed, independent, and all of that. I mean, it's a way of becoming a millionaire or a wealthy guy. Um, I've seen bank employees uh, who became millionaire being employees, you know? Um, so Swiss banks. Swiss banks or even abroad, like in, in the US, I, I met I met a um, real estate promoter in Switzerland. His girlfriend's dad uh, used to work for, um, I, f I forgot which bank, in Miami. Mm -hmm. He used to be one of the top dogs there. He was making about 900K a year, you know? So, I mean, Switzerland, US, even in the Middle East. As an employee, you can make money as well, you know? You just have to play your cards in some sort of ways, you know, dealing with politics, company politics and all of that. So yeah, among my clients, I had uh, independent guys, um, also employed, employed guys and all of that. So, you know, they have a, a stream of revenue, regular revenue, so they don't touch the capital. And then if, you, if they close it to retirement or if they're retired, then they might extract a little bit of, of capital every now and then, you know, and depending on market conditions. Uh, if the markets are down, they won't uh, withdraw money because, you know, they're losing money. So they'd rather keep the money invested, uh, expecting a, a growth of the, of the assets again. Have you had years where like you lost money? Like of course, of course, big time. Like COVID, uh, COVID uh, was was a big time loss for for some clients. Some clients were were smart enough to bear with it. You know, uh, I can give you one example. At that time, it, I'm, I'll, I'll be talking about two two cases. The, these guys weren't my clients, but they were clients of people I used to uh, be a support of. Um, so one client, uh, it was a, a lady, she had $15 million um, dollars invested in mainly in stocks and bonds. And when markets went, went south, uh, the assets went from 15 million to about seven, eight million, you know. And just before markets went down, she called us and she wanted to liquidate the assets. And for some reasons, the relationship manager, following the discussion, the lady was a doctor in finance. So she knew what was happening, she knew, you know. She ultimately decided to keep the assets invested and it went down nearly half, you know. I, 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 was, I was going crazy, you know, like, what will the, 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 the client think? You know what, two months, three months later, she recovered everything, you know. She recovered everything because she was expecting uh, central banks to bring down interest rates and boost the markets again and don't let, you know, big crashes happen. This is one case. Another case, um, the client lost about nine to ten million dollars in like three weeks. Uh, so he was invested in very risky um, structured products. He was a, a, a very knowledgeable guy in investments. It was mainly his ideas uh, to invest in those products. If we didn't have COVID, he would have made big time profits, you know, because of COVID, which nobody expected. Um, he had margin calls for about eight to $9 million. A margin call is basically the bank sending you a letter. You have to send $9 million in the next two days. Otherwise, we cut your positions. Wow. And he didn't have $9 million to send within two days. So positions were cut and yeah, $9 million loss in three weeks. Yeah. Wow. The clients that do the best, right? Like the clients that kind of like you see, like they're, they're progressing. Is there any particular like character traits that you have observed, you know, with those people or their, or how they treat money in the first place? Yeah, I mean, honestly, it's, um, my observations are, are mainly based on, on cultural differences, you know. I've been dealing with non-resident Indians based in um, Africa, uh, mainly Kenya, and also in the, in, uh, in the UAE. Um, so they have a particular way of, 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 uh, of viewing money. Um, you know, they're very careful with their spendings. Uh, I had a client who had 25 million at the bank. Uh, he, and when he came to Geneva, he looked at the cheapest hotel around the airport. You know? Really? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and then I have uh, another client who was negotiating fees of, of 2,000, 3,000 bucks. And same day he spent about 100K on watches in Geneva. <laughs> so, so, yeah, it's, a, it's mainly a cultural difference uh, rather than, you know, industry, industry related uh, mindsets or however you want to call it. Maybe the richest ones of your clients, how they're making those decisions. Are they making decisions fast? They're taking time to think about it, evaluate it, get some external advisory, like stuff like that, or they're just gone? Like, If it's, um, again, I have the, the impression that the more they are self-made, you know, less inheritance and all of that, the quicker they make the decisions. It's more about gut feeling rather than, you know, a, a complex thought process and all of that. So, so, so yeah, the, if they come from a like middle-class family, studied, 
had a good job, you know, some, some guys in accounting or whatever came up with their own um, accounting firm. They take, they take longer to make decisions, you know, because they, they think like they have so much to lose. It took so much time to build the wealth and all of that. Uh, but self-made guys who went based on gut feelings and, you know, um, took the risk, they kind of found the, the, the recipe to make money. So they're not scared of losing money. Um, I have a client who, who, who lost about $700 million. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. Uh, he, was, he had about $900 million in net worth. Uh, he had to make a quick decision because of oil markets in 20, 20, 2007 or or something like that. So he had to make a quick decision to sell properties and all of that to cover a uh, margin call on, on positions he had on, 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 on oil. And yeah, he had to liquidate $700 million. Uh, he crossed the billion after eight, nine years after this wow. uh, story, you know? So I asked him, I said, but were you confident? He said, look, if you know the recipe, you know how to cook, you can make your food whenever you like. So, yeah. Wow. How old is he? He's 60, 60 something now. Yeah. He just, no, you know what? He just turned 60 last year. 60. Yeah. 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 Where's he from? Oh, this I cannot disclose. Okay. He's <laughs> basically from, from Africa, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. How much you were making a year? With that? Uh, look, yeah, when I was uh, at the bank, if you consider the bonus and everything, um, a couple of years back, I was about 150K a year. Um, now, if you consider, I, I like to call it cash in hand uh, money, uh, the equivalent in places where you pay taxes, because, you know, as I'm going to, to, to Dubai where you don't pay taxes, uh, the parity of a country where you pay taxes, we can, we can be uh, close to um, uh, 200K a year. Um, basically as salary. Very nice, very nice. And you, would you work like a lot, like would it? Yeah, when I was working at the bank in, uh, in Geneva, you know, as it was a, a, new, a new team, um, starting from scratch, and we had to bring the clients in. We, we were basically on a business plan for three years. So if you don't make your, if you don't achieve your goals, you're out. Uh, so we had to make uh, the, the, the best of our, of our time. So we used to leave the bank around 9, 10 p.m. Um, also, I was working with the, with the team where three of the guys came from uh, the UK, from London. Mm. They were bankers from London. So they used to, every Monday, come to Geneva and every Friday go back to London. Wow. Yeah. And they are, their families and everything there in London. So when they were in Switzerland the whole week, it was here for, for, for the grind, you know. So I was there with them. And that's why we, we used to work that, that hard. And you said you would have to generate your own business? Look, when I joined the bank, as it was, uh, I, firstly, I joined as a corporate, uh, in the corporate team, uh, Swiss corporate team, as mm -hmm. an uh, assistant, uh, doing a, a postgraduate program. Um, then I joined the International Wealth Management, private banking international, where I didn't have any connections abroad. So bringing my own clients was, was not possible for me. So one way of making it is, uh, you know, you're, you start by being assistant to a guy, then you get promoted to a client manager, relationship manager and we, we have two types of relationship managers the farmer so you're in the bank they give you clients and you take care of the clients then they can become your clients if you're good at your job and then you have the hunter so they have a network they join the bank mainly on a business plan of three years and they have three years to bring all their clients uh to the bank so um, then a farmer can become a hunter if a banks give if a bank gives you a, a job as a farmer another bank offers you a better role you know, a better paycheck and all of that, you can join the bank, bring the clients that you were dealing with to the other bank. And you become a hunter, kind of, you know. And uh, life, life is more difficult as a hunter because you have to bring the clients, you have to bring business, and your salary is basically the same, but your bonuses is very different, you know. Uh, as a hunter, if you don't bring in business, your bonus is very low. Uh, if you bring in business, bonus can be very high. So people at 32, 33 years old taking about 300, 400K in bonus, not working that hard, you know, leaving the office at 6 p.m., 7 p.m. And some farmers, they have a, a basic, uh, basic average bonus, you know, because, you know, business is already here. Business is running. You just keep keeping it running. Um, so, yeah, it's more about between 80 to 120K bonus as a farmer. So with Hunter, it's like, do you go to some high, like, very, like, fancy parties, like, how, how, where do you even get those clients or just message them on LinkedIn? Hey, you know, like give us like 50 mil, yeah. right? <laughs> Look, there, there, there are many, many means. I mean, the, um, a lot of bankers, what they do is that they start in a bank. And at some point, you know, when a, when a banker leaves the bank for another bank, let's say, 
usually they have a retention rate of 50 to 60 percent meaning that 50 to 60 percent of their existing clients they're going to take with them oh wow yeah. so they're always like 20 30 percent of clients remaining in, uh, at the bank so you need to find someone to take care of these clients and this is where you as a farmer you you get your role you know if you're an assistant you might get promoted to a relationship manager as a farmer so you start taking care of of, of clients you know and Usually teams of bankers leave together. Like you might get two bankers leaving together, uh, leaving uh, at the same time. So you get 60% uh, uh, all in all clients remaining. So, you know, you become a farmer, take care of the clients, they, you, you gain their trust. And then now they, they, they're part of your network, you know? Then other means is that, you, yeah, like you say, you go to, um, to places where you have um, probabilities of meeting those guys, you know? Um, Dubai is a very cool place for that, you know. Uh, mm. When I was with uh, Malik in Dubai, we were in a, in a sky pool. Sky, like it's the highest sky pool in the world, I think. Uh, I was just walking around the pool with Malik and I got, I got, uh, they did, there's a guy that he's talked to me about my tattoos, you know, and uh, came out, he, he, owned, he owns a, a hockey team in the US. Uh, he owns a, a, a movie production company. Uh, he was one of the wow. of the of the production team who who who, um, who shot the last uh, Equalizer with Denzel Washington and stuff. Oh no! Yeah, I love that movie. So uh, I met the guy, and he was a pretty cool guy, you know. And with him, there were other guys, you know, dealing with Bollywood stars and all of that. So you know, you're at nice places, and like I used to, like we used to talk with Malik, you know, as as long as you're a relaxed guy, you know, conduct yourself in a proper manner. Uh, you have you have uh, codes. Mm -hmm. I mean, people are willing to speak to you, you know, you, you might get uh, to start the conversation, they might get to start it or whatever, but at the end of the day, just be yourself, as long as you're, you know, decent person. Uh, so, yeah. So you want to become a hunter? Look, not, not really, not really, to be honest, because I, I've been around with uh, some, some big guys where if I, if I bring clients, it's going to be their clients. It's not that they have anything against that. But the way I viewed the business is more that, you know, instead of me bringing their clients in, even if they're okay with that, I'd rather bring the guys in, you know, the big guys, the bankers and stuff, I'd rather bring them in the business. They bring their clients, so the clients also feel, feel, feel comfortable by having a, a guy that they know for over 20 years, 30 years, you know. And I'd rather focus on the investment side because uh, this is what I like, you know, coming up with ideas and all of that. Of course, I like the social side of it, like socializing myself, talking with these people. So as an investment manager, I'll get the chance to do that, travel to their countries, sit with them, speak to them. And then my main job will be investment manager. But again, if I have to bring in new clients, I make a, a, a contact anywhere I go and this guy wants to be a client, of course I'm bringing the clients. I also have this relationship manager side of the, of the role. They have like $30 million, right? Getting like what, I don't know, right now four or five percent like it's yeah, basically pretty good market yeah. you know kind of like good yeah. rates for that i want to make more for mm -hmm. instance right so mm -hmm. come like what what questions would you ask me kind of like what would be the the things that you need to know like in order to so so i mean one of the first things that we we will we, we'll try to assess your risk profile um basically asking questions there's a very um uh, objective part of it where we ask questions and based on the answers we we, we can come up with your risk profile and then there's a more subjective part of, uh, of this assessment where, you know, we discuss, we talk, and this is part of my s kind of soft, soft skills to identify where, where you want to go. Uh, part of the question is like, um, how much liquidity would you need within the next year, two years, five years? Do you have kids? You want to fund their studies? You want to, um, you know? Let's, let's yeah. break one, sure. each one of those down, yeah. right? So liquidity, for instance, mm -hmm. right? So liquidity means you can pull the money like if exactly. you need to? Exactly. Uh, at, at what extent would you need like cash, you know, in the next year? Uh, for example, I, I just bought uh, real estate in Switzerland, uh, like a land I'm building a, a house near a ski resort, uh, purely investment. You know, you have to bring the down payment, which is about 20% in Switzerland. So if I was, if I, if I had those millions and I wanted to do some sort of investment, uh, real estate investment like, I had the money two years ago going to a bank they're trying to assess i would say to them in two years i need 20 percent of of cash you know so at least they know that they wouldn't go for long maturity investments you know for example bonds you have bonds maturing in one year two years 10 years 30 years 
uh, they know that they wouldn't go for the 30 years one you know because you need the liquidity in two years so these are the questions that we, we want to speak about um uh if, if you have a a, a, a kid who's like i don't know 10 years old uh, you know that in eight years you want to fund his university we know that you look there's some funds that in eight years you'll be needing so um these are the types of situations where we that, mm -hmm. that we use to assess your your risk profile you know how much are you willing to lose you know because sometimes markets go go south so you, you need to bear with the risk some people they see they see minus three percent they go crazy oh you really know? yeah they want to cut the positions immediately so this is again your job to calm them down explain to them that look i had a client he lost 80 80k in two days because he panicked on a silver uh, he was invested in silver there was a move on silver for for a couple hours and he decided to cut the positions lost 80k for nothing because immediately it went back up you know so how much can you bear the, the the losses on on an account so there's a lot of of uh biases that people tend to have that they're not familiar with they're not even aware of that so we call that behavioral finance uh we use that a lot you know to assess those biases and and, and work on that Wow, so a lot of psychology, right? Let we have to, we have to. That's that's a big part of the of the job now. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So let's say if you wanted to do, if you give me an example of something that gives, you mentioned on the on the safer side, if you want a kind of like relatively safe investment, mm -hmm. would be like five six percent a year. Uh, in 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 the in the current uh, market market environment, yeah. You know, we have um, high yields, uh, uh, high rates now, you know, because of inflation, they had to uh, uh, bring up the rates, you know, to kind of slow down the, the economy in some sort. Um, so as long as you have high rates, you know, uh, bonds, they offer high rates as well, because why would you invest in bonds if uh, treasuries, US treasuries are giving you more uh, return? So now for uh, for an investment grid like high quality bonds, yeah, we, we might target around the five, 6% return and it's, uh, it's not riskless, all right? But the probability of default is like for triple A bonds is less than 0.1%. I used to say you have more chance of your bank going bankrupt than the bonds going default, you know? Mm. Oh, no, on that side, um, there, was a, there was a situation, Credit Suisse or something, like a few Credit Suisse. Yeah, there was like a, or it went bankrupt, right? Or something like that. It was close to bankrupt. It didn't go bankrupt. I used to work for Credit Suisse. Oh, uh, really? In Geneva, yeah. Oh, that was, oh, uh, wow. Exactly. So uh, all the stories I'm telling you was, I was with Credit Suisse. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it didn't go bankrupt because UBS bought back the, the bank. Mm -hmm. uh, so it didn't go bankrupt, but it was very close to go bankrupt. Yeah. What, was, what was the reason? A lot of reasons. You know, there was, uh, you know, in, in 2021, we had two big cases of uh, of kind of mismanagement of of some funds. Um, for instance, I had a we had a supply chain fund which uh, did not perform as we wished, and there was some kind of I mean there might be some legal case on it. So whatever I say, don't quote me on that. But um, there were some legal cases. They they were supposed to be an insured version of the fund. And basically they weren't paying their insurance or something like that. So the fund wasn't insured. So when it went south, clients didn't get their money back and stuff like that. So it was like about six, six, eight or 10 billion uh, wow. loss basically for the bank. Another, another fund, Archegos fund, which went south as well. This was another 8 billion, you know, knowing that the bank is making about 2 billion profit a year, it's already, you know, 15 billion that they had to now managed in, in some sort of way to cover and then some some other cases you know uh fraud cases um and things like that so i think it, it was not just one thing which made the bank go south it was a accumulation of many things yeah usually the uh, swiss uh you know financial system is one like one of the most kind of trusted yeah, like yeah, sure, in the world sure. like considered you're dealing majority of, like international clients uh, we, we had um, separate entities. I was working for the International uh, Wealth Management Entity. So mainly, well, international clients. Then the, uh, we had the Swiss entity dealing only with Swiss clients. Um, so I would say the biggest part of the bank is uh, Swiss clients, uh, you know, because they go from retail to ultra high, so they cover everything. International, they only do uh, high net worth and ultra high net worth. They don't really deal with retail and affluent clients. 
it's, it's I mean, they don't they don't make a lot of uh, return on that. You know, I mean, cash accounts, paying t-shirts at the store, that you know doesn't worth it. Um, and depending on which countries uh, clients are in, are in um, regulations are different. Mm. So for for Swiss Bank to accommodate to all the regulations for all types of clients, it's not very profitable. Yeah. How is the the fee structure? Let's say, uh, is there like structure depending on the profit? Let's say or on, on the returns. Like there's a like hedge funds that say have like two and twenty or you know whatever. Yeah. Like is it something similar? Well, as a as a banker, if you're taking care of the clients, we don't really have the type of hedge fund uh, fee structure, which is the 220, like two percent management fees and twenty percent performance fees and all of that. This is more of a of a fund type of structure fees. Uh, as a banker, we basically have the the brokerage fees. Every time we make a trade for a client, he's paying a fee. We have the the custodian fees. So basically, of having the assets at the bank, paying a fee, which is around, I mean, if the more money you have, of course, we, we're having deals on, on those fees. But on average, it might be between 25 to 30 uh, basis points, 0.25, 30%. Um, brokerage might be around that as well. It can go up to 1%, uh, depending on how many trades you're doing a year. The more you do, obviously, the cheaper you're getting the deals. Um, and then like small, small fees every here and there for your credit card, uh, debit card, but yeah, we can we can we can run the. We can also have all-in fees if you want to have uh, like an all-in fee. You don't pay for every trade. You have like maybe 50, 75 bips all-in fee. This is for you know if you have ten million and you're a very active uh, client, you can do that. Margins on on loans can be around seventy-five to one percent, seventy-five bips to one percent. So. Um, Broadly, these uh, in this in, in this ballpark. You've had experience like it's with Swiss Swiss financial system, and uh, now like in Dubai, it's mm-hmm. obviously different financial. System. What are the major differences between these two? You know, in in Dubai, uh, they're more um, open-minded when it comes to business. Uh, they are more uh, willing to speak to you and be creative in the solutions. Uh, they are more aware of how um, about the market uh, dynamics around the world. Uh, Switzerland, for example, I was like I told you, I was uh, uh, mainly active on Sub-Saharan Africa market, and when I had to get deals done with the Swiss guys, they weren't comfortable at all because Africa is like a red flag. It's a red flag when you don't know the market. Obviously, I mean, I come from Mauritius, which is an African country, and if if you know the market, you know the the risk of the market. You know how to mitigate those risks. You don't have to be scared. You know. And Dubai, they have more knowledge about uh, those um, less known markets, more exotic markets, you know. So they're more open to, to, to discussions. Would you say Dubai is one of the like most kind of like used financial hubs right now? I would say Singapore. Singapore. Uh, I would say Singapore is, is uh, for me, I mean, maybe I'm being a, a little optimistic, but Dubai might be the next Singapore as a financial center, you know. Uh, because they're evolving very fast. Um, the regulations are, are, are getting um, um, more and more efficient, you know. So uh, for me, Dubai is the, is the next Singapore. And Singapore is a, is a very known and, and efficient uh, financial center in the world right now, you know. Uh, for trades and everything, they have very efficient regulations. Um, so yeah, Dubai might be the next Singapore. So this is on on that side of the is is US still in the picture? Of course, of course. I mean, US is is still a, a big market with a big big players here. You know, um, they are very good in uh, in corporate business as well, investment banking. I mean, the deals that the US are are doing in terms of investment banking is uh, I mean, I think it's the only place in the world where they get the, the these type of deals done. You know, uh, big corporates. Uh, you know. When I talk about investment banking, it can go from anywhere from issuing stocks for a company, doing an IPO, uh, issuing bonds and all of that. And I mean, you know, the biggest companies are in the US, so no, in the US is definitely a big player. But when it comes to wealth management, again, Switzerland was, uh, you know, as we know, Swiss is very famous for watches and private banking, you know? Yeah. So uh, we have very skilled people working in the US, of course. But again, the US is like, I, I wouldn't say close to the world, but it's it has it has enough to deal with 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 itself, you know. Uh, whereas in Dubai or the UAE or Singapore, they are small places, so they are 
they are more willing to be open to, to the rest of the world. Have you worked with many like US clients? No, in Switzerland, you're not allowed to. I mean, it's, oh, wow. it's very, very specific, you know, uh, uh, because of, of, of regulations that came out in, uh, after the 2008 crisis and all of that, you know, FATCA, FATCA regulations and all of that. So in Switzerland, no, I, I, I was, if I had a client who was traveling to the US, I wasn't allowed to speak to him. Wow, that's even crazy. Like for two, if he was going on vacations for two weeks and he calls me and he's like, I'm in the US, I need to make a transfer or I, I want this trade to be done. I'm not allowed to speak to him or take any instruction for him working from Switzerland. Wow. Yeah. Even if it's not a US client, I'm talking about a, uh, an existing client who I, I can deal with when he's not in the US. Is it because like, U.S. is very cautious about like money laundering and of stuff. Of course, of yeah. course, of course, definitely. I mean, this, this money laundering became a, a big concern for the whole world, you know. But back in the days, you know, Switzerland with the bank secrecy uh, was the like, you know, place to, to bring you money. So, um, so that's not existing anymore. Not really, not really. I mean, bank secrecy uh, at first it was the bank not allowed to disclose their clients' names, correct? Unless there's a legal case where the authorities requesting the names, which was the case before, which is still the case, you know? The only difference now is that if you were a US citizen before and you take a, a, a bag of $1 million and you go to, the, to Switzerland, you drop the bag there, well, who, who, who will know about it, you know? Now today you cannot do that anymore. You have to open your bank account, transfer the money, you know, wire the money. Um, and for us to open your bank account now, we need to sign the, the FATCA form. Uh, which is issued by the IRS uh, here in the States. So um, you need to, it's a self -de declaration basically saying that you're not a US uh, person. And if you're one, you're uh, uh, declaring your, your assets to the US. Uh, we, are not, we are not in charge of making sure it's the case. That's why it's called a self declaration. So it's, you signed it, you said you're doing it. If they come to us saying you didn't do it, it's onto you and we're gonna, you know, tell on you. I mean, not me, of course, but you know, Authorities. Does the same rules apply to Dubai? Like in Dubai, do they ask no, you for the no, same? No, 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 not really. I mean, Dubai's regulations is, uh, is more flexible. Uh, I don't mean it in the way that uh, they're open to any type of business. They make no mistake, they are very strict. They are very uh, uh, savvy about, you know, money laundering and all of that. They're being very careful about it. It's just they have a different approach. It's all about, um, you know, um, agreements that countries have. Uh, and for instance, Dubai in the, um, in the UAE, they don't have that type of agreement that with the US that Switzerland has, you know, it's all a matter of agreements. If I ask you to disclose and we have an agreement on that, you're gonna have to disclose. If I don't ask you to do it, you're not gonna do it by yourself, right? Mm -hmm. So this is more of the type of situation that I'm talking about, rather than Dubai not wanting to disclose or hiding money whatsoever. Interesting. Are any of those other, uh, so there's like Dubai, there's like Abu Dhabi, I think, right? There is like yep. Saudi Arabia, there is Qatar, like yep. any of those emerging as well as like big financial centers or attracting like a lot of international business? I mean, for now, uh, Dubai is the main one, you know, and it was uh, done on purpose. I mean, the UAE decided that Dubai was going to be the place for tourists, for real estate investments, for, they have a, a place called DIFC, so it's the Dubai International Financial Center. Mm -hmm. This is where I'm going to work. Uh, so nice. if you want your offices in that place, uh, you need a license to be there because you have to be a financial company to be there. You oh, know? Wow. So it's, it's literally a financial center that they have it there, you know? I mean, uh, Abu Dhabi might, might go on that path as well, but there's still enough to do in Dubai yet before it's saturated. So I think Dubai is the main place to be. Wow, fascinating. So you are like the f uh, relationship manager, mm -hmm. right? So you directly interact with clients. Exactly. Um, and then, so let's say when you're identifying the strategy of the investment and stuff like that, is there like analysts or someone that you work yeah, with sure. directly to execute on that strategy? Yeah, sure. I mean, if, uh, you know, we have relationship managers, they are no, not very investment savvy. So now they bring in specialists. Uh, me going on the in investment side, being an investment manager, uh, I, I'm, my willingness is to be one of those specialists, you know, that uh, you might call if you, 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 you need ideas and all of that. Then you have relationship managers, they're very investment savage, you know, so if they do it all by themselves. Uh, so, so we have all type of, of, of uh, relationship managers, but the whole thing is to have specialists in everything. Now, tomorrow you come to me for a corporate deal. I'm not a corporate banker. 
but mm-hmm. I know a corporate banker, a good corporate banker I can bring in and do the deals, you know. Uh, you need financing for a yacht or a jet or whatsoever. I'm, I'm, I'm not do, I'm not a specialist in that, but I know a guy who's doing jet financing, so he's going to be part of the deal, you know. So it's all a matter of uh, it's all a matter of creating synergies between among specialists. Mm, interesting. And so to to become uh, the financial manager, you, you mentioned you've studied like many years, right? Yeah, I mean, I have uh, I have a bachelor's degrees in uh, economics. I have a uh, master's degrees in uh, management with uh, uh, finance options. Uh, also, um, uh, did uh, CFA, which is uh, like the kind of highest certificate quotation marks that you can have in the the financial industry. Uh, I still have one level to clear out of three, but um, I cleared two levels in, in nine months. Usually it takes between two to four years wow. to do all all three. Uh, so uh, I, I was quite in a hurry of doing it. So, you know, um, so yeah, I studied and, you know, I still study every time. I mean, if, even if I'm not doing something official like a proper certificate or something, I still, you know, read, keep myself aware of what's happening. Part of my job, like my previous job was, I was paid to read two to three hours a day, you know? I, I was on Bloomberg and reading stuff because I, I need to be aware of what's happening in the world. Is, yeah. is Bloomberg like reliable source of information? Top notch, I mean, yeah, 100%. You had access to the paid Bloomberg though, right? Exactly. There is, the, there is like the kind of something, they charge subscription base or, so, or, or, it's, or it's complex corporate, version of Bloomberg? Well, I mean, anyone can have it. It's about 40K a year. 40K a year. Yeah. So uh, the company I was working for um, paid for, for, for that. And I had the, the, the computer on my desk. So I used to be the... Yeah. Wow. What, what do you have there? Like, do you have like news? Okay, this yeah, happened, yeah. this country. Everything, everything. Uh, and the setup is, is, is quite nice because, you know, you had the, the news flow where you, you had the headlines popping up every two seconds, a new headline, you know, uh, from sources all around the world. So you might have a, 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 something that came up in the news in Germany, pops up in the US, it pops up. So you have everything condensed in, in one database and you have it, you have access to it like in seconds. You know? So that information then is then used to make like investment decisions? Sure, sure, sure. You know, uh, analyzing um, assets. Uh, I, I use Bloomberg for that. I mean, my, my decisions were mainly based on the, the data that I was able to retrieve from Bloomberg. Yeah. Would you like, let's say, sometimes you would see some news or something happening with particular, would, would you give your client a call and say like, hey, you have to cut this position or move out of this position because like this is happening or something like that's ever happened to you? Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's a, a slower process. You know, if you get the news that, you know, for, for example, we, we wait for inflation figures every month, you know, if uh, when, when inflation was at the highest and we were waiting for this figure to come up. Inflation if, in the United States or inflation in, in the Europe? United States? You know, the U.S. basically give directions for the rest of the world. Still? Yeah. yeah. Like this is not, I mean, there is obviously China like rising, rising and still the U.S. Still, yes. the US. I mean, it, it's not it's not something that that's officially done whatsoever. It's just that if if, if the US is going south, you know, you 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 you'll be more careful with the with the global investments uh, assets. Really? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. So still, everything is so predicated yeah, on the United yeah, States. Yeah, hundred percent. Wow. Do you see China emerging like? Kind of like becoming more important. In of that course, aspect. of course, it is. It is already the case. I mean, we we we, we allocate a, a little bit more there. But the thing is that you know, the, the the more you get in 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 markets that you don't you don't you don't um, you're not very aware of. You're not a specialist of. There are some aspects of of risk that you you have more difficulties to manage. Uh, for example, in 2021 or 2022, uh, uh, China came up with the with the tech stocks cracked down and came up with regulations and all that stuff. We weren't expecting that, you know, we were talk, they were talking about uh, taking away uh, US equivalents of Chinese stocks from US stock, stock markets and all of that. You never, you never say from, you know, them just waking up and taking decisions and can't, cannot do anything about it. You know? so these are the type of risk that you have to be aware of. You mm. have to be specialist of these markets for me. or invest in funds, mutual funds, where they have specialists, you know, we, our exposure to emerging markets were mainly done to, to funds, you know, uh, because they are specialists. So let's rely on them. Yeah. Wow. Interesting. So 
with crypto, right? That crypto has been like kind of, mm -hmm. you know, emerging like very fast right now. I think we're in the, in the bull run. So mm -hmm. do you see crypto taking over some of the banking system like in general? I mean, it's been hyped as is, right? Like decentralized kind of, you know, system that everyone can use and stuff like that. But mm -hmm. do you see any of that? Do you see any implications or do you see the impact that it has done so far to the banking industry? Um, take, taking over the banking industry system, I don't see that happening. I don't see that happening. However, uh, I had more and more clients who wanted to be invested in cryptos uh, through ETFs and, and all sorts of, of, of structures or directly invested. Um, now where, where crypto is going, you know, my opinion, my personal opinion on crypto, um, I made money uh, out of crypto in 2017, 2018. I would say by luck, honestly was no analysis behind it or whatsoever i see crypto as a as as an asset class where you can make money okay um but it's a very volatile asset uh a very risky asset um is there any fundamental value out of let's say a bitcoin not really okay so uh back in 2021 i decided to look at the correlation between crypto markets and you know stock markets so uh, I did a, a regression of uh, on Bloomberg. I did a regression of the Bloomberg uh, of a crypto index, mainly based on Bitcoin and Ethereum, and uh, looked at the correlation with the Nasdaq, mainly te tech stocks. There was a correlation of, of, of 60 percent. You know, then it doesn't explain everything. I mean, I cannot say that 60 percent of Nasdaq explain uh, cryptos, but still, there was a correlation in the, in the uh, last two years. Then I was talking with, uh, with Malik about that, you know, is inflation impacting the way of cryptos, direction of cryptos? At some point you could see that to a certain extent, yes. So it's now crypto is becoming so big that it's not completely independent from all other asset classes, especially in, in times of, of crisis. So, Can you elaborate what that means? Yeah, sure. So back then, if let's say stocks are going up, crypto might go down, like completely opposite. Uh, now they tend to, even if they go sometimes in the opposite ways, not that much as before. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So it becomes like just like another, almost like as another stock kind of. It's going thing. towards that, 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 that manner because it's becoming so big, like everybody's investing in crypto now, you know? Uh, I mean, my, my barber is invested in crypto, <laughs> you know? Uh, so so there, there's, there's a famous saying, this is your barber starts talking about being invested or, or, or trading, you should get out of markets, you know? I mean, 2021 was a, a bullish uh, year for crypto as well as for stocks, you know? 2022, mm. both went down. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to bring up any correlation, but we could still see a slight correlation between both asset classes, you know? So again, uh, not advising anybody, my personal opinion concerning my own assets, that's some legal disclosures. Uh, uh, if I have a hundred bucks, I'll still put 10 to 15 bucks in cryptos. Uh -huh. 10 to 15% invested in cryptos. Kind of like as a portion of your portfolio. Exactly, exactly. But at my age, if you're 70 years old, I wouldn't advise you to do that. <laughs> but at my age, you know, I'm still willing to take some risk. I still have time ahead, if God will. So. So yeah, 10 to 15%, I would put my own money in, in, in crypto. Has AI impacted, you know, banking or investment, you know, approaches or technologies or uh, simplify the process in some ways or help you analyze the deals faster, help you analyze the Bloomberg faster, like any of those? Not yet, but it will soon, very soon. And it will be a big change for the industry. Um, according to my own thoughts, it will be a big change for the industry because we already had, uh, uh, algorithms uh, which used to trade by itself. If you hit that level, it's going to trade. Right? Exactly, exactly. For example, uh, so now with AI, I'm 200% sure that it's going to be a big time change for the industry. Now you have people who they, they don't know something, they just ask chat GPT and they have the answer. You know? Correct. Uh, I have a friend who he, he used to be an accountant for one of the big fours. He knew a lot of stuff that took me two years to learn, you know, just asking chat GPT. So uh, it, it, it's as well very dangerous because you cannot just rely on that. You still need uh, judgment for me. Uh, you know, this personal skills of a relationship manager, investment manager. But it's, it's going to be there very soon. It's going to be a big change uh, for, for, for the industry, I'm sure.
Are, are you like, do, do you think some of the, some of the positions like will be caught like in the financial industry because of that? Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Uh, when it comes to, you know, it has, it has already been the case with the e-banking stuff. Uh, when I started at the bank, we used to have teams of, of uh, payment processing, you know, we receive like a, a payment instruction, send it to the team, they process the payment. You uh -huh. know, this team has been cut more than 80% because of e-banking. Now everybody did just scan their bills and pay it from there, you know? More than 80%, I guess, was cut. Where do you see this industry going? Like any particular, you know, things that you would just take into consideration? Like where to invest and stuff like that? Yeah, I mean, you know, my, my first advice to anybody is not to be greedy. First of all, not, not be greedy. You know, I know people, they made... I know a guy, he invested 2,000 bucks in crypto. I'll just give you this example. Not, it's unrelated to your uh, question directly, but he invested two, 2K in cryptos. After nine months, he had 200K, all right? He asked me, what, what, he didn't really ask me, but I told him, I said, bro, you're 26 years old, just sell the stuff, at least half of it, you know? 26 years old, you have over 100K in assets didn't really listen to me because, you know, it was a bull market and everything. So now he lost pretty much everything, you know, uh, because for me, it was greed. Uh, I made uh, more than 80K on, on cryptos back in 2018 in three months, cut the positions. Was I able to make more if I had left the positions? Of course. But hey, look, it was still 80K in three months, you know. So same thing I would give uh, people who, who wants to be invested. Um, first of all, save money, invest your capital, um, and, and be very diversified. This is the mainstream speech, you know, but be diversified. Don't put all your eggs in the same basket, as we say. Um, go in real estate, go in stocks, bonds, crypto, alternative investments, watch. Uh, I, I love watches, you know, uh, you have a nice one, by the way. Mm. Um, be invested even in that. Now they're coming up with the uh, structures that invest in, in, in watches, you know, be invested in everything. Oh, know? really? Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, wow. Cars, even cars, you know, they're doing pools of investments for cars. Like you can invest in like a Porsche 911, uh, it costs, I don't know, 150K, you just drop down 5K on the, and, be, and you're part of a pool, you know? Same for watches, so be, be diversified. That's the main advice I can give to people. Be diversified and get a uh, if you have if you're a wealthy person have a good specialist that can advise you, mm. you know? um and going to uh, work for an external asset manager i can i can only advise them because they don't have this conflict of interest of making money for the bank uh sometimes this might be an issue you know mm -hmm. you might sell products to the client because you have to reach your your, your sales targets Oh, interesting. You know, uh -huh. As an external asset manager, we get paid based on your assets. So our main goal is to grow your assets. Oh, wow. You know? Interesting. So we, incentives are aligned, basically. Exactly. Exactly. We will pay the management fees based. It's a percentage of your assets. Mm -hmm. Bigger your assets, big, big, bigger the, the revenue we're making, right? So we don't really have this. Uh, I'm not saying this conflict of interest exists. I'm saying it might exist, you know? It's like so, Wolf of Wall Street, right? It's like, hey, you know, sell these like low quality products to people, right? And you get like very high commissions. So the incentives are skewed towards like, it's not towards the client's interest, yeah. right? It's just like making as, as much commissions as possible exactly. without, you know, caring about yeah. like the, the, the client's return. The turnover might be big. I might, might get you invested in, in, in an asset and want to change it in one year because I want you to do the trade because I get commissions on the trade, you know? Uh, so I might get you a product that's maturing in one year just for you to get in another, in another one in one year, you know? Mm. Uh, so as an external asset manager, that's not the, 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 the goal. For me, my goal is to make you more assets, you know, because I'm paid for that. This is interesting. I think Charlie Munger said that, um, you know, if you, if you want to see if for certain things are happening or not happening, look at the incentives. Exactly. Right? True. So True. incentives and, uh, yeah, it's important to realize you know, the kind of the incentives of people that you work with and like whether those incentives are aligned with, with your own exactly. goals. Exactly, true. Wow, um, oh, Baba, I mean, I've, I've learned so much. Um, how do people connect with you? Well, I have uh, LinkedIn, they can contact me on LinkedIn. Um, Instagram is more personal, but uh, thanks to uh, Malik, I'll, I'll be coming up with a professional Instagram very soon. 
um, but mainly on LinkedIn. Um, so um, I don't know. If yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll drop it below uh, yeah. so you guys cool. can connect uh, if, if you want to learn anything about, uh, or maybe you have, you know, 30 mil <laughs> just laying around, hey, look. <laughs> you know, and uh, yeah, thank you so much. I've learned a lot about, you know, the, the industry and yeah, it's very fascinating. My pleasure, my yeah. pleasure. Thank you. Thank again. you. Thanks a lot.